Coming up on UGTV, Standing Committee Meetings of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. A meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee. This will be followed by a meeting of the Economic Development and Finance Standing Committee. So we will go ahead and welcome everyone to this meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee. Public input is welcome on any item that comes before the committee. If you wish to make input, either get my attention or some other member of the committee, you'll be able to come to the podium in the middle of the room and you'll have three minutes to make your comments. We do ask that anyone who is speaking to the committee please speak as directly as possible into a microphone for accurate recording and broadcast purposes. First order of business is roll call, please. Roll call. Burroughs? Here. Walter? Here. Murguia? Here. Townsend? McKiernan? Here. There are no revisions to this evening's agenda. It will pr proceed as distributed. Our next item of business is to approve the Standing Committee minutes from our October 30th, 2017 meeting. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve those minutes as submitted. All in favor say aye. All opposed, same sign. Those minutes are approved as submitted. That takes us to our committee agenda and item number one, our only item on tonight's committee agenda, our land bank business requests and I'll turn it over to Mr. Chris Slaughter. Thank you, good evening. Um, looking forward to another strong uh, year with the land bank. So uh, we'll get started right away. Quite a few items tonight, um, but a lot of business as usual. So we're gonna start off with some application requests. We have six for you tonight. 
four yard extensions, one property acquisition, one single family construction. Um, all applicants are current on their taxes. All applicants have no code violations. The first one is a yard extension for 2312 North 34th Street. Um, all land bank property is highlighted in red and the applicant is outlined in black. 2923 Lafayette Avenue, another yard extension. Third yard extension is 2313 North 12th Street. It's kind of small property there next to it. And the final yard extension is 2756 North 22nd Street. We have one property acquisition that's for 900 Lafayette, which is located right here. The applicant's properties are up here to the north. And we have a single family construction at 455 North Bluegrass Drive. Um, this is the property in question, some information on that. Um, the proposed is a 2,000 square foot ranch or craftsman style home. It'll have a separate two car garage. Um, they are proposing a 40 foot permanent easement here on the north with a 50 foot going down the easterly line. Um, it's an approximately over $240,000 build and they uh, hope to get started here this spring. Um, they are working also in conjunction with the Bonner Planning Department uh, and I have spoke with them recently and they are all um, very enthusiastic about this project to this point. So the request is for approval of these applications so we can forward them to the uh, Board of Trustees for final approval. Any questions or comments regarding these properties? It's motion to approve. Second. There's a second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, roll call, please. Roll call. Walters? Aye. Mergia? Aye. Kiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Uh, next, we have a transfer to the land bank. It's 2700 North 18th Street, and the current owner is the Unified Government. Um, this property uh, was brought back to the UG through a mortgage foreclosure. Uh, but there's currently over $6,500 in back taxes. So really the ask is let's transfer to the land bank, abate those taxes, and then if approved, we'll present uh, the ask to transfer it back to the unified government once that process has been completed. So again, the request is to approve the transfer to the land bank, um, and then we can forward for the Board of Trustees for final approval. And I'm just curious, what's the ultimate disposition of this property, the ideal disposition of this? Um, it, it, once it goes back to unified government, um, they're, what they've explained to me is it'll probably be then moved over to Habitat so they can get it finished up uh, for one of their families to uh, uh, take possession of. So was this house previously occupied and now not because of the foreclosure? Um, I'm going to refer that to uh, staff. Commissioner McKiernan. Why don't you come on up to the, to the table here? This property was originally this property was originally a home uh, new build. The resident decided she needed to go into a nursing home. I see. She got back behind on her taxes and she turned around and just signed it back to us because she hadn't been able to fulfill her commitment. So then the ultimate resolution here is that we're going to look for someone else to occupy and pay for this home. Habitat will go in, clean it out, do the freshening up, and resell it to one of their uh, homeowners. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or discussion on this item? Second. There's a motion and a second to approve this item as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call. Walters? Aye. Mergia? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs. Aye. And so we also are going to have the ask that once we do abate the taxes, that we then will transfer it back to the UGs for the, the uh, dealing with the Habitat group. So same property, second step of the process. I'll entertain a motion. Move for approval. 
Second. Motion and a second to approve as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call. Walters? Aye. Merguia? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Uh, next, we have three donations to the land bank, 1329 Webster Avenue, 6007 Kansas Avenue, and 954 Ivendale Street. 1329 Webster Avenue, uh, the current appraised value is $500, but there's currently almost $10,000 in back taxes. The 6007 Kansas Avenue, as you can see shaded there in yellow, uh, it's currently appraised at 58 over 58,000 um, it is current other than the first half taxes for 2017 haven't been paid and 954 Ivendale Street it's currently appraised at 760 there are no current back taxes on it so again the request would be to if approved to forward those for final approval at the Board of Trustees question um, on that first one did you say that the current value of the property is five hundred dollars correct and there's ten thousand dollars in back taxes on it yes it's a vacant lot yes it's uh, shaded in yellow but does that ten thousand dollars also include like demo of a previous building that was there um, I, I don't have that in there but I'm gonna go ahead and assume based on the value of the property is not generating a lot of tax so there's probably a good chance of a seventy five hundred eight thousand dollar demo there was a structure it. there at one point and we tore it down probably yes okay how, how big is the lot um, from the looks of it I would say it can't be no more than probably 35 to 50 feet wide and probably about 100 120 feet deep And that five hundred dollars is the county's appraised value. Correct. Do, do we have a lot of vacant lots worth five hundred dollars? Um, in certain areas of the county, yes. Um, I would. So where can you tell me where this is? I'm not sure. I know. Thirteenth and Webster. Um, I, I'm a little fuzzy on my geography, but let's just say real, pretty close to 13th and Quindaro. It, I just don't know if it's to the north or the south. Okay, thanks. So this is a property that wasn't generating any taxes anyway. Somebody had, I mean, assuming if my scenario plays out that they abandoned the house and we tore the house down because it was in need of demo, you know, another way to look at, at at this is with the back taxes um, and the eligibility to be put into a tax sale, we would have to then forward it over to the delinquent real estate department, right. have them work it up, get it into a tax sale, and more than likely it's going to come to the land bank anyway. And the person who's donating it, is that the person who owes the back taxes? Correct. Uh, yes, sir. This is a question for legal, Mr. Chairman. Do we have a floor that we identify as an amount that we can deny accepting anything into the land bank? I'm not aware of any, Commissioner. Uh, ask Chris if you're from practice. Is there any? No, I mean, this, this is pretty low. Uh, I'm sure if we went back, did some research, there's probably others that have at a less value than this that we've accepted um, but but yeah generally the practice is is uh, per the request we we present it as long as um, there's no mortgage or any kind of notes that we wouldn't be able to extinguish once it came into the land bank if I may, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. so we, we deed this property to the land bank the land bank then does what to the property if the value is only five hundred dollars uh, you put it out for bid to uh, a private contractor, private entity, at which the value would then be more than $500, I would assume. Uh, th that's a possibility, yeah. I mean, it would, it would join our inventory. Um, as you can see, there's a pretty good saturation of land bank property in, in the shaded red properties in that area. Um, so there's a good chance that, you know, the demand to develop may be pretty low right now. Is that just one structure next to the vacated property? 
that correct seeing? yeah just to the west of that thank you thank you mr chairman So any other questions for Mr. Slaughter? Otherwise, we have three potential donations to the land bank. OK, uh, I'll make a motion that we approve these three properties. Second. Motion and a second to approve these donations as submitted. Roll call, please. Roll call. Walters? Aye. Merguia? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Definitely aye. <laughs> yeah. Before we move on, Chris, that parcel where we own, you know, in your map, we own maybe a third of the property in that particular little area. Is that a area that the land bank is trying to accumulate property or, or is it just working out that way or I, I would say it's more towards working out that way um, you know in in the past the cycle has generally been a, a private request for a tax sale um, amounts this high that no one would ever think of paying um, close to ten thousand dollars for that property um, so you know from an from a strategic standpoint, having it come to the land bank so we can abate those taxes and then hopefully be able to sell it maybe for a couple hundred dollars is probably the only plan of action other than it going into a tax sale and then still coming to the land bank and we're right back kind of that starting place again. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the tax sale from last December, tax sale 339. Um, we have um, property that was either not bid on, so it's coming to us, and there was property that was bid on. However, they did not redeem it by the deadline. Um, so again, as we did uh, last month and we did back in August, we're presenting these properties uh, for your approval. Uh, the ones that did not sell at the actual sale, we have 102 of those. 12 of those are houses. Uh, there is a parking lot in that amount, too, and we have 90 vacant lots. And then we have 24 that were bid on and did not get redeemed, and 23 of those are houses, and a parking lot is in there, too, and one vacant lot. So we do have, uh, you know, over 30 houses that will be coming and being part of the rehab program once we go in and uh, inspect, evaluate, uh, hopefully all uh, 30 of those plus will be rehabable and we'll have those uh, presented to our rehab uh, group um, so basically that is the ask that those properties be approved to come into our possession and so at this point we've just acquired these properties have we had a chance to inspect them to determine their worthiness for rehabilitation or is that next that is next uh, I don't believe any of them have actually been deeded to us yet but once we do get possession of them then yes uh, and myself then, and mr. Brockman will start that process and then at that time we can determine whether or not those actually do go to the rehab program or if they just end up being on the demo list correct and then we'll have open houses and hopefully we'll receive offers on them and we'll just keep moving forward with the rehab program point of curiosity when someone bids and is awarded the bid but then does not redeem is there a penalty involved in um wendy you can back me up on this i believe they're banned from tax sales for one year seems like i'm surprised that there are that many that were not redeemed right no we banned them for two years actually and some of these people came in and bid on multiple properties but then didn't come back and pay for all of them so I think some of them, their eyes are literally bigger than their stomach, and they think they can get all these good properties, and then they realize how much they've spent, and so they only pay for one or two, but not all of them. And in that situation, we still do ban them for two years. Interesting. But there's no penalty on the ones that they did not redeem. There's no cost to them. No, there's no cost. 
but effectively they generate properties that aren't redeemed and we end up having to deal with that after they aren't able to fulfill their commitment. Well, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate because perhaps some of those would have been successfully bid on by someone else. By someone else, yeah. That they're kind of tied up now. Uh, any thought of putting them back in the next sale versus taking them into the land bank? That's what we used to do. And the property, a lot of them, some of them would get sold again, but some of them would not get sold again. And so it would just sit there in that cycle of yeah. purgatory, I think, yeah. is where Tib is used before, where it just keeps going in and out of sales and nobody does anything with them. From a SOAR perspective, the way we've been looking at it and presenting this to commission is, is that once it's in the land bank, we can assure that that product comes out on the back end, if it's not demoed, completely rehabbed, up to all code. We can't guarantee that through the traditional tax sale process, but we can through the land bank. So from a benefit to our neighborhood, as long as Chris can move it, we're better off. And, and I'll just add that, you know, we are boarding and securing them. So if, if we did put it back in a sale and maybe it was another six to nine months, a year of it just being possibly wide open, not really on our radar or attention, um, at least this way we're securing it, keeping people out, and then, and then working the program, so. Yeah. Is there an opportunity for those that may not have gotten the original bid to be revisited to see if they'd be willing to take the bid if someone backs out on, on the bid? If you have two bidders and the lower bid, uh, have you, is there a criteria keeping us from dropping down to, this, to the lower bid and asking them if they're still interested in the property? Other than the fact that we'd have to put it out to public sale again if we did that, I don't know that we traditionally would ever go to the backup bidder. We haven't that I have seen in looking at past tax sale documents. Um, I would think just from a legal standpoint, if we don't automatically take it like we do now, the better part would be to put it in another tax sale so that it would be available to the entire public. Because some of these properties, multiple people were bidding on them. It wasn't, I mean, this person who won the bid but didn't come back and pay just happened to be the sole survivor. But some of these were bid up quite a bit. So from a legal standpoint, I don't know that I would feel comfortable going back to the other top bidder when we wouldn't even know necessarily who that might have been. We don't keep track of who's bidding on them. We only keep track of who won the bid. So it would be hard to even figure out who those people were. It kind of, it's pretty fast paced. And if you've never seen one before, I would suggest come on and watch how we do it because it's very interesting. <laughs> um, but it's, it, it's, there's no way to keep track of how many different people are bidding on a property all at once. So the request is to approve our, the acceptance of property from tax sale 339 to be forwarded to the land bank. I move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Walters? Aye. Merguia? Aye. Kiernan? Aye. Burroughs? Aye. Uh, this next item is just for information only. It's the uh, 2017 conveyance report. Um, we conveyed, sold, transferred a total of 143 properties last year. Um, 10 of those did go to our uh, CDC nonprofit partners. Um, the total amount of revenue generated was um, almost $190,000. And just to put in perspective, um, the amount of what we ended up spending on the boarding just in the rehab alone was about $60,000 less than this. So we feel that we, we, we contributed to kind of offset, you know, part of what a uh, huge expenditure for the rehab program is um, by generating that. I will say it's not the highest we've ever had in the land bank. Um, but uh, we're pretty proud of what we did. A lot of that does reflect um, the, re the rehab um, sales uh, in there, um, but we'd still sold our fair share of vacant lots for yard extension and our property acquisition too. So 
Chris, do you know how many of these 143 were houses? Um, <coughs> I think I have that on the next slide. We do have an update on the rehab program, if I can go ahead and go, unless there's any other more questions on this. We have one question on the revenue generated, that 190. Is that cost of sale not the estimated cost of taxes that will be paid on these, correct? Correct. That is just the amount of, of dollars that were we agree to per property to be paid so for. These them. properties will now all generate additional tax revenue above and beyond what they had been generating when they sat in the land bank. Correct. Some of those tend to our nonprofits may end up being in a tax exempt status, but yes, a majority of this should start generating some tax revenue going forth. Uh, I believe um, there are mechanisms in place to start tracking that, and I believe that'll be reported in upcoming SOAR um, okay. meetings or reports. Thank you. Yeah, we're currently working with Judd on a series of dashboards to show the impact of land bank and SOAR initiatives together, so that'll be really exciting to be able to see that live as we move forward every day. Okay, with that, I'll just give you a quick update of the rehab program. Um, we are up to 42 contractors from the last time we met. We have increased that. Uh, 70 houses currently in the inventory. Um, 20 of those are in the demo program, and now that we've reached the first of the year, we do expect those to be down here shortly. 58 are in the rehab, and of those 58, uh, 20 of them are in the process of rehabbing. Uh, nine of them we've had approval from, um, or we've either had approval from the county administrator's office or we've at least got to the point where we're finalizing negotiations of an offer. Uh, we have 13 houses that have had no offers, meaning they've gone completely through uh, the inspection, the open house, and just for some reason we haven't received an offer. We are still working those with existing uh, contractors. Uh, we have 14 open houses scheduled for tomorrow, so let's hope it does get a little, continue to get warmer. Um, we have one house that um, is at 8th and Freeman. And if you've driven by there, it's just a little bit west of Sumner Academy. And there's a bunch of property that we own, but the majority of the property is owned by one individual who's trying to sell. So we're, uh, I've asked, um, we're waiting on a reply from the district, uh, school district, to see if there's any plans for that. Because I don't know if there's upcoming plans. I'd hate to have someone go in and put some money in a, and rehab this property only to turn around and possibly maybe be part of some larger program with the district. So we'll, we're going to kind of just hold that and see what goes on. And then one of them, um, we did notice that there is um, someone still occupying it, and I believe that the sheriff's department's working to evict that person. And we are up to five houses that the rehab's been complete. And number five is 2806 South 23rd Street. And we'll just give you a little update. Pictures on the left are the before. Pictures on the right are the after. And here's a shot of the of the rear of the property uh, here's the kitchen little galley kitchen um, trust me the bathroom picture on the left was pretty trash that's the only picture we had but they did a great job of uh, rehabbing that and just some information on that it took them a month and a half to rehab this was also uh, done by uh, Jay Block who have done uh, four or three of the other rehabs that you guys have been presented with so far uh, at the beginning of last year it was appraised at uh, over a little bit over sixty eight thousand um, dollars they did receive a full asking price offer within one week and that was about one hundred and twenty four thousand dollars so uh, again uh, another property that we're happy to be uh, to have taken possession, um, put it through the, the program, and again, come up with some awesome results. Another ripple effect, the neighbor next door had completely poured a new driveway, had a new roof put on it. Um, so, you know, as the months go on and we present, we'll ho hopefully have more and more success stories for you guys uh, in this program. So that's all I have to present unless there's any other questions. So five completed projects represents 2017 calendar year, essentially. Correct. So now we have 78, and we just got another 27. 
the 27 or those are reflected in that 78 number so we have 14 or about 16 that we're just about halfway through our process before we make a, make them available for offers to receive in the open houses uh, we only sell them to one of the 42 approved contracts correct okay well I hope that the pace will really pick up in 2018 well as we mentioned you know we have 20 that are in the process and some of these guys um, have other jobs so they're going to be a little bit slower than a month and a half two months um, so yes, we we definitely feel in 2018 we'll shatter that five mark. <laughs> uh, the question will be how much, but um, yeah, we we're, we're really starting to see some good traction with this. Five is good, absolutely. Chris, can you go back a couple of slides? Yeah, keep going. Okay, on the um, let me see. 13 houses with no offers. How long have those 13 been on the market? What's the um, longest? What's the shortest? The longest has probably been since summer, so maybe six months. And um, some, some of them have probably been made just a couple months. So we, we, we have another rehabber that has expressed interest in um, putting offers in on at least half of those. I sent them some offer packets last week via email, and those would be due if they're interested in uh, next Monday. Um, we, a couple, we have a couple contractors that are really wanting to ramp up the number of houses that they have just based on the scale they think they're able to produce. So that's why I think one of the reasons we're very confident of having a pretty banner year with the rehab program. Personally, the goal would be is to come and say we have zero houses with any, that have no offers on them. Um, there are a couple that are going to just be downright challenging to do, but they're just not in a demo state. So maybe we have to reevaluate if it's been out there for so long, then maybe we have to look at other options and stuff. Um, the other exciting thing is bringing on people like CHWC, Habitat, uh, Avenue of Life, as just um, one of the new contractors. So some of the nonprofits who we feel that can turn around and do some good and put, put some good people in these uh, finished products too is what we're excited about. So how many years have we done this a year, just one year? Um, we started in the spring, so we're maybe about nine months into it. So um, as we make more progress, it's not anything urgent. It would be kind of nice to see um, a map uh, visual some type of visual aid that um, indicates where the houses have been acquired and how marketable they've been because um, I think the SOAR program is great and what we're doing with Land Bank, Bank is fantastic but if there are some areas that are struggling more than other areas we might be able to drill down then and look at um, other kinds of incentives to enhance those more challenged areas that don't seem to have as big of a market as others. I, I think that's a great idea. We'll, we'll definitely start working on presenting that. Um, I just want to add that we're at the mercy of the tax sale. Um, we're not putting any houses in any requests to be put in tax sale. We're based on what's being put in and basically what's left over. Um, but yeah, I, I, th I think that'll also probably still dictate the same message of where our struggling areas are. Right, That's. I mean, I think that's a good point. That's gonna send us a message if there's only, so I'll use Brian and I, because we're both in the urban core. So if you've only acquired five out of my district and 50 out of Brian's, then that in itself, is an issue that what challenges are is Brian having that I may not be having if they're not even getting to tax sale do you know what I'm saying sure um, and then how fast are they turning once you acquire them and if my five are turning very fast and Brian's are not turning fast we might want to look at um, the residential incentives in that area 
Sure. I mean, I, I think that plays to Commissioner Walters, your question earlier about demand and w even with our vacant lots, because a lot of these houses are going to be located in the same neighborhoods or same areas, too. So, um, but yeah, overall strategies for that is something I think we're working on, and I think SOAR is paying close attention to, too. So, um, as the year goes on, yeah, hopefully we can um, present some, some ideas for that, or at least uh, maybe relay on some of the existing um, strategies that are presented. Commissioner, we do have um, a lot of mapping that we are doing right now, um, again, with um, our new um, performance management and data analytics individual that's in our CKO office, Judd Knapp. So we will be able to show you a lot of this visually. Um, the latter part where you're talking about, you know, sale prices and things of that nature, um, definitely um, a great idea that we will keep looking into as we move forward and try to get that information back to you guys. Thus far, this is a great way for us to acquire these, get them off of the streets being open and unmaintained and making them safe while we are trying to find a future rehabber. Well, I think SOAR has done a great job, has done a great job over the last year. and. I don't have any actual documented data, but I would tell you that my district is made up of Argentina and Rosedale, and they're very different. As you know, the sort of economic boom around the medical center and the hospital, Rosedale um, values have seemed to increase, um, as well as the demand to live there has gone up. And I attribute what you're doing with um, the SOAR program and the land bank that um, in Argentine where it's more challenging, um, I have yet to see a for sale sign um, in my neighborhood. So, um, and I've seen lots of independent rehabs above and beyond the land bank program and um, the SOAR program and stuff. I think that just has to do with keeping things neater and cleaner. It's a much more attractive neighborhood. So all that's working very well in my district. Anything else for Mr. Slaughter? If not, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And Welcome. It's exciting to know that those 20 with the rehab has already started could be, in fact, completed by the end of this year, if not sooner. So that's fantastic. For anyone in the public who was here uh, regarding a land bank item, all of those requests were approved as submitted. And you can talk further with Mr. Slaughter. We have no other business for this committee. We are adjourned. We will reconvene in just a moment as economic development and finance. Well, we will now call the meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the develop, Economic Development Finance Standing Committee to order. And we want to welcome everyone this evening. And public comment is welcome. Anyone wishing to speak on any item on the Standing Committee agenda may do so when the item is up for discussion. You will have five minutes to state your comments. Please come forward to the microphone at that time. You will be recognized. For accurate recording purposes, we ask all present to speak directly into a microphone. First order of business is called order. Roll call. Bryant? Here. Walters? Here. Mergia? Here. Townsend? McKiernan? Here. Burroughs? Here. 
revisions to the agenda, I do have uh, a, a revision this evening. The, the, uh, the agenda, we, I think this is where we go into items one, two, and three. Is that correct? We will. We do have a request that item three in his chair. I have the, uh, if there's no exception, no exception to taking the agenda for a revision, I would move that we revise the agenda this evening to accommodate uh, num item number three prior to the presentation by finance. And so item three would go first. Yeah, item three would be first. Then we'll get back to item one and two in that order. So Karen Goodsell would, would like to uh, present early. If that's all right, the rest of the committee will just move to item three. And Commissioner, I'm sorry, I think we do need approval of the minutes. Minute. Or do we go into the first item? I would make a motion. Uh, I would entertain a motion approval of minutes from October 30th, 2017. Move to approve as submitted. Second. Motion made, seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Seeing none, motion minutes are passed. We have no measurable goals, is my understanding, for this evening. So with that, we'll move into item three. Welcome to committee, Carol. Wendy's actually going to start first. Good evening, commissioners. Wendy Green with the legal department. Um, the reason this is on, and really what we're asking for more tonight is guidance um, from you all. And so we've, we've proposed it as a change in an amendment to the ordinances um, to where if senior citizen applying for rebate would apply for one rebate or the other, but could not apply for both. However, if after discussion, when looking at um, Carol's presentation, if you all decide that no, status quo is the best way to go, then that's how we will proceed. So really, we, will, we are fine to do whatever you all want as far as either amending the ordinances or leaving everything the way it is. And I think you'll have a better understanding of why we're presenting it that way after you see Carol's presentation. Good evening, Chair and uh, fellow Commissioners. Um, as stated, my name is Carol Gotzel. I'm with the Unified Government Clerk's Office. And for the benefit of the TV viewers and those present here this evening, I'm just going to point out a couple of facts about the two programs. First, the utility rebate program was initiated in 1972 and actually implemented in 1973 and the city sales tax was approved in 2006 and implemented in 2007. To be eligible for either one of the programs, three qualifications must be met. The first one, the applicant must be 65 years of age or older for the entire calendar year for which they are applying for. So for those people making an application this year, they had to be at least 65 years old as of January 1, 2017. They must be a Kansas City, Kansas resident. So those living in Bonner Springs or Edwardsville would not be eligible. And lastly, the annual household income cannot exceed $25,000. Applications are taken during the first three months of the year here at City Hall on the third floor in the clerk's office as well as at the Area Agency on Aging at 47th and State Avenue. And for those people who are viewing this, I hope that they're looking at this slide and jotting down phone numbers. In case they have questions, they can certainly call the clerk's office at 573-5260. So what's refunded? Under the utility refund program, it's 90% of the water pollution control charges, 11.9% of electric and water, and the franchise fee paid for gas and to AT&T for telephone services. And the utility refund program does have a cap of $150. Under the city sales tax refund, uh, the, the rebate depends on the applicant's income, how many months they lived in Kansas City, Kansas, and what their marital status is. So if we look at the bottom line, if the applicant's income is $20,100, we go over and we look and see if they lived in KCK for the entire year, 
they would be eligible for $124.08 if single or $151.52 for a married couple. Now let's say the same applicant didn't move into KCK until October. They would only be eligible for $10.34 times three uh, for a single applicant and then the 1261 times three. Any questions? Okay, what this represents is our monies paid out for the two programs over the last three years. So in 2015 and 2016, when the two applications were considered as one, I should say the two programs were considered as one, we paid out a little over $147,000 in 2015 and $136,645 in 2016. Now when the two programs were split, uh, we paid out 122236 in utilities alone, and then a little, well, 83800 almost in city sales tax. So by splitting the two programs, it actually hit our budget by 51%. It so increased by you, 51%. Can you explain why that change? Because they may not understand why. That's well, the critical part. <laughs> okay, go ahead. The reason this all came up was in 2016, the auditor's office reviewed um, the applications and they determined that the two programs were meant to be separate by ordinance, but the way the application read, they were combined. And so rather than getting up to $300 for both refunds, if they were eligible for them both, um, they were capped out at 150. So once that was discovered, um, two applications were then made so that the programs could be um, run as separate ordinances and separate refund programs as the ordinances were intended and written rather than the combined application form which treated it more as one refund program. And as near as we can tell that happened in 2006 when the sales tax refund program was initiated and the utility refund program was amended. Um, one application form was submitted and just from then on they were treated as one program even though by ordinance they should have been treated as two. So the numbers increased in 2017 when the ordinances were treated as separate refund programs as they were written rather than one combined program. I will note that this year we staff does believe we have sufficient funds in the budget to cover both programs. We actually have budgeted 122,000 for the utilities and 83,000 for the sales tax. The reason being is, uh, as you can see, the trend is it typically goes downhill rather than increase. So again, what we are asking for this evening is guidance on whether or not the commissioners would like us to continue on the path of treating the ordinances separate and therefore um, two re different refund programs that senior citizens could apply for or to be able to not have to budget for that increase any longer by amending the ordinances so that a senior citizen could come in and apply for one or the other but not both because it was, has been determined that some seniors are only eligible for one of the programs and so we would hate to cut off one of uh, an, a senior's ability to get any kind of refund whatsoever. So the idea would be to keep them both available but still go through the one or the other but not both. If we leave the status quo as it is, then they could still apply for both refunds if they qualify. Any member of the committee have questions, comments? I do. So, I'm looking at that, I see the 122 for utility, 84 for, for sales. So, so you, you know, looking back at when the second ordinance was first instated, 2006, how was it written at that time that you know, was, was it stated that they're only applicable to one? They can only, they have to choose one or the other? 
No, it, the way the ordinances were written, they are two separate ordinances, mm -hmm. and so a senior could apply for both if they if they wanted to, and if qualified, they would get refunds under both programs. But unfortunately, when the application was done, the way the application read, it was a one or the other scenario to where they capped out at the the higher amount, the 150 or the 151, and some change depending on what refund it was, rather than being able to get both if they actually qualified for both. The application actually came to us as one. So it used to be that only the utility portion appeared on the on the form itself, and then when the calculations came down with the, the income brackets, it was just slapped into the same application and therefore treated as one with a cap of $150, even though the calculations on the income shows $151 for a married couple with the highest income. So, so how many applicants do we have annually for this? Um, I had that. We, it's like, I think we're now down to about close about is 850, eight, like in the upper 800s. It, it's been decreasing steadily as time goes on. Decreasing. Decreasing. So e either the either the applicants are you know, moving out of the city, uh, their income is exceeding the qualification guidelines, or they're just no longer with us. Yeah, because I mean I, I understand the the fifty percent increase, but but you know really if you look at it from two thousand fifteen, it's not as much. Uh, it, it just seems that you know especially if you're looking at seniors that are at twenty five thousand or below. I, you know, I'm, I, I'd be hard pressed to, to vote to, to remove any chance they have for any kind of rebates, you know, considering how difficult it is for them to get by. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine getting by on less than 25000 a year. I guess your question really is, is do, uh, can our budget withstand the 80 something $83,000 increase? I would hope that we'd find a, there'd be a place to find that. So that's, that's my only comments. I, uh, I have to say, I think that uh, I'm comfortable with the current practice, which keeps it as two separate uh, programs, which seems to be what was intended by the two ordinances. And maybe unfortunate that we didn't do it that way from the start, but I think we've got it right now and I'm comfortable leaving it the way it is. I certainly think that our budget can handle that impact, the monetary impact. So, I, would, I believe it would be a motion to deny or not, just I, or if we're not approving at all. Is that the kind of motion we would make? I don't, since the staff's position is neutral on this, correct? Mm -hmm. So. I'm not sure if the standing committee um, does not wish to forward this to the governing body. I'm not sure that a motion is needed. If, it, if it's this, this would maintain the status quo to take no action. Correct. Okay. And they would be allowed to apply for both and, and grant both if they qualify. qualify. Correct. What's the least cumbersome for the members of our community in need of this refund? Go ahead, turn the microphone on. As far as um, whether they can apply for both or is, there I'm would sorry. be an education requirement on the two separate to separate the two there would be an education process that we would have to uh, communicate to the public they're used to this practice now being the way it is so any change would have to take some kind of public um, notice of some sort uh, some kind of education process uh, notification that the process is changing so the least cumbersome aspect would be to stay the status quo. For, for our, our applicants who came in last year, they are aware of the two programs being split. So they were uh, very happy to get the extra monies last year. Uh, as far as uh, getting it out to the public, we welcome any commissioner to invite us to their meetings with their neighborhoods. Uh, and we're open to any suggestions as to how we can put it out. 
Uh, historically, we've sent notices to churches, uh, but that didn't really seem to increase our applicants. So we're, we're, we're open to suggestions as to how to get more uh, notice out there to the public. The utility tax you're referring to, is that um, a refund on things like your lights and bills like that? The utility exactly. Tax? On your Board of Public Utilities, uh, like I said, like 90% of the water pollution control charge is rebated back to the applicant up to $150. And that the water pollution control, ch control charges, that's the highest that they receive back on the BPU bill. Um, and then on, on the electricity and water, also collected by the BPU, that's 11.9%. And then for the telephone, which a lot of people now, their telephones included with their cable bill, uh, that's not rebated back because they don't pay the franchise fee in that way. So it's only those people who have AT&T only, it's not the bundle package, but for AT&T telephone only, they get that franchise fee back. And that's very minimal, uh, like maybe a dollar fifty a month. Does that utility tax rebate come from the unified government budget or from the Board of Public Utilities budget? Well, it's monies that's, that the BPU collects for the city. So I, it's part of the pilot fee, right? Yes, it is. So it's unified government money. Yeah, so it's basically monies that the senior has paid in that they're being rebated back up to $150. Does the utility offer a rebate program for senior citizens? I'm not 100% sure. I know that I've had a phone call from someone just not too long ago about just trying to get their bills so that they could apply for a rebate, but I'm not sure if that was from this rebate program or one I'd have to find out from the utility. Is there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, any member of the public wish to speak? make comments in reference to this issue? Seeing none, what's the committee's prerogative? Please, please make no action. Make no action? Status quo. Okay. Legal, you say we need no motion to leave it as such? I don't believe so. If there's no motion on the floor, uh, I think the, let's go to the next item. All right. Very good. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you ladies. Thank you. Mm. We'll move back to uh, the order of the agenda, which is item number one, and that being the uh, here, item number one. That will be the uh, Finance Department Services. Kathleen Von Aiken, our CFO, is here to make the presentation, and we've had a discussion, and we hope to get through this in a intelligent expedient manner but one that allows us the knowledge to learn what it is you wanted to teach thank you very much uh so the I, we thought that we would start out the year um 2018 with a brief um discussion of uh the finance department and the many services that we provide in order to give you a, a good overview of that as we enter into the 2019 budget process um and I've, I brought with me my deputy, Debbie Johncher. So um, hopefully these are just some key things for you to know about the finance department, some of our more recent initiatives, <coughs> right? So as you know, as you know, we provide uh, policy, fiscal policy recommendations, and our department oversees all the financial transactions of the UG. Um, our mission, um, we, you know, we did some strategic planning amongst all our finance uh, managers, and um, what we've come up with is our own mission <coughs> statement, which is to partner with UG departments in fulfilling their missions, and to, to optimize UG resources, and to act as a steward of UG assets. But we want to provide risk mitigation and act as consultants to our departments so that they can make strategic decision making. 
um, make strategic decisions, and also to provide uh, and safeguard and monitor the UT financial resources and provide analysis to elected officials and to the administration. Um, the, currently, the UG has a, a credit rating um, from Standard & Poor's of AA and from Moody's of A1. And uh, we are, on Friday, going to be doing uh, credit rating presentations uh, f with both of those credit rating pres um, agencies. And uh, we're hoping that um, perhaps one of them um, specifically, Moody's may upgrade our stable position to um, a positive um, outlook position. So, you know, we're we're seeking to get an upgrade in our in our um, credit rating. Um, we did some strategic planning. I brought I started the with the UG two years ago, uh, almost two years ago, and um, over the past two years, we've had a couple of uh, strategic planning sessions with uh, my my own staff, and we came up with um, our vision and our motto, and that's and our vision is to become a resource to the organization, um, and in order to turn ideas and plans into reality, but doing it through a fiscally responsible and collaborative um, approach. So, so we we just like uh, I the Department of Knowledge also is a resource to the departments. Um, you know, the UG has roughly 40 departments. We, we, we see ourselves as uh, at all those departments as our customers as, as well. So our team, we have a team. We, we are, the key thing is for us to see all our projects as from a team approach um, to respect um, the work of all the UG employees, to provide excellence, and to, to encourage and provide courage um, amongst all our, our uh, um, staff as they seek to f solve problems. So, and the motto is funding the future. So that's what they came up with. We had a collaborative team that they came up with these, the, the motto. So, Debbie. Uh, as Kathleen said, I'm Debbie John, the Deputy uh, Chief Financial Officer. I'm just gonna go over our, the organization of the Finance Department. Um, we currently have 59.75 um, members within the finance department. The department is led by um, the chief financial officer, Kathleen Van Atchen, and myself, um, and we have six divisions um, within the finance department. We have treasury, capital and economic development financing, accounting, budget, payroll, pension, and insurance, and then research, which we'll be going into in more detail um, a little bit later. Um, there are also a couple of divisions underneath each of those. Uh, Treasury has both the motor vehicle department and the revenue and cash management. Accounting also has financial reporting and accounts payable. So we'll start with Kathleen. Um, Kathleen, the department is led by Kathleen, the chief financial officer, um, and myself, Debbie Johncher. And we provided just some information into our background um, for you if you wish to inquire. Um, we've also provided some information um, regarding our team. Reginald Lindsay is our budget manager. I believe he's um, been before this committee, um, as well as Rick McKesslick, our, our accounting manager. Mike Grimm is our research manager, and Ron Green uh, heads our payroll and insurance department. Currently, we're recruiting for the treasury manager position, so we don't um, have um, this position up here. Other members of our team include Elise Villarreal. She also helps out with the capital financing, and she's heavily involved in the debt, as well as Michael Peterson and Judy Herr in the budget department. Um, Lisa Nolan is our deputy treasurer and she heads the treasury and cash management side and Andrea Parr is our deputy treasurer over the motor vehicle. And Pam Cahal, she is our accounting management analyst. She works under Rick McKessick in the accounting department. Right, so the, the next few slides just kind of talk generally, it gives you kind of a visual of all the services we provide. Um, Budget, you know, we've got a $358 million budget. Um, accounting, basically, we're, we oversee it. 
the annual financial audit, but we also manage all the financial assets of that for a $1 billion worth of total assets. Research, um, the research division where we talk about Mike, he, he manages um, a great deal of information and provides a lot of information to the elected officials, departments, and, and non outside agencies. And uh, he, he has about 200 uh, public, he handles about 200 information requests a year, so quite a bit. Accounts payable, we have, uh, we process 25,000 vendor payments and 24,000 um, purchasing card transactions. We have 20, in payroll, we have 2,200 employees and 13 labor contracts. And uh, capital financing, we, we fund roughly over 100 capital projects a year, every year. But we also um, do development finance. We work very closely with the Economic Development Department uh, in, um, in actually doing the debt issuances for various economic development projects. And we also review a lot of the pro forma financial proposals. Um, motor vehicle, pension, revenue management. So we'll, we'll go over these um, in later slides. And property tax administration and cash management. So more individually, in for the accounting division, um, headed by Rick McKissick, the, the, key, um, the key function of the accounting division is to um, administer the internal controls of the organization and to, in order to enhance our financial reporting. But it's also to diminish the opportunity for fraud and to reduce um, process variations that lead to, that may lead, by reducing the variations in, then it's, we're able to, um, to provide more predictable transactions. And the, the, whole, the whole point of the financial audit and monitoring transactions and, and, and uh, implementing internal controls is to diminish um, any kind of risk we may incur due to fraud or, um, or human error, all right? And so we take this very seriously. We have over 40 account uh, uh, accounting um, policies and procedures, and uh, and we review those policies and procedures and practices every year. Um, one thing that I did want to point out is that the GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, that's the national organization that uh, um, that all the public finance officers and local government, local and state government. Um, you know, we, we, we all, we're all members of that organization. Um, they, they have a, an annual award program, as you know, and that um, at the award program um, looks at excellence in uh, financial reporting, and the UG has won that 18 years in a row. So, um, so we do an annual audit by, um, and it's done, conducted by an independent audit firm. And so a lot of this you already know, but I just thought we'd kind of refresh your memory a little bit. Um, now, one of the other things the accounting division does is they also process all the accounts, pay, accounts payable. So roughly 50,000 um, payments are made every, every year. Um, just to give you an idea, the audit, the audit process starts um, in January and February, and February as we work with the departments to close the year, but actually in December as well. Um, then we're, we be, right now we're, and then February we start developing all the support documents for the financial audit. And um, the auditors actually come out to visit for a, a couple of weeks to do not only their testing of transactions, but also to um, develop the, to review all of the support documents and to ensure that everything, all the practices and policies are being complied with. And then um, within the accounting division and, and with Debbie and I, we prepare the financial statements in the comprehensive annual financial report in May and June. And that presentation is made to the EDNF and to later to the, to the commission um, in June. So. May I ask a question? The the uh, how how is the auditor picked? To are they on a three year contract, five year contract? Is it a sealed bid process? So we we conducted an RFP last year 
for our auditors. Um, we um, typically do it do the RFP every five years. Five years. Yeah, and so the the contract that we just signed with our auditors was for three years plus I think three years plus two extra years if we so. And who makes that determination as to uh, pick the auditor through the bid process? Is it the the committee itself? Is it uh, your agency or is it the administrator? So the, the, the RFP selection committee um, um, all vote on who which audit firm should be selected and so that's what I'm getting at who is the RFP committee well um, it the RFP committee well the RFP for this last one included um, a number of folks from the accounting division but also several folks from well a couple of we had uh, Lori Austin from the it, we had Lori and the accounting manager from BPU, and then I think we had a couple of members from some other departments, didn't we? I don't remember. Yeah. Thank you. Ultimately, the contract is signed by the county administrator. So, so basically, the, the selection committee makes a recommendation to the county administrator of who was voted or selected, um, the vendor selected, and then he ultimately approves it. So the um, Treasury Division, you know, there's 60, roughly 60 um, FTE in the Finance Department, and uh, about half of them are in the Treasury Division across the street. They're also, well, they're in two locations, over in the Annex, um, off, off, I think, 82nd, or, or eight, I'll have it, I have it up here, so, um, uh, 82nd and State, I think, and, um, and then down across the street. and. So, but uh, uh, you know, they do a lot more than just motor, just motor vehicle. This, so this division here is the non-motor vehicle portion of the Treasury Division, just so you know. And there's a lot going on. They basically collect all the revenue for the UG, um, and they handle over 250,000 customer visits and 50,000 telephone calls a year. Um, they also process property tax payments for 50,000 residents, and they're also investing, uh, uh, well, they work with me on the investment of roughly $100, $180 million portfolio. So, so they got a lot going on, a lot of things going on. Internal controls is an important piece of the Treasury Division. Um, yeah, okay, now tell me this guy. I'm going to talk about the... Uh, I'm going to talk about the capital financing and debt administration. Um, Kathleen, myself, and Elise um, handle most of the financing of the capital projects. Um, the capital bond issuance, pretty much once the budget is approved, we start working on the next bond issue, which occurs in February. Um, so from October through March, we are working with municipal advisor, our bond council, um, as well as UG departments to get ready to um, issue those bonds. <clears throat> we oversee both the GEO uh, bond and note issuance as well as the equipment lease program. Debt administration, once the debt's been issued, um, there's a lot of work that's um, required after we issue the bonds in addition to just paying the debt payments. We're required to, um, we have semi-annual uh, legally required disclosures um, to the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. Um, we, have, we're, we have annual credit rating surveillance, arbitrage rebate reports that are required to be submitted on all of our bond issues every five years, um, as well as making sure that all bond and interest payments are made and properly accounted for. We also um, are constantly working on our creditor investor relations, um, working to improve our UG credit rating with Standard & Poor and Moody's and Kathleen talked about the fact that we're looking on this next issue to um, try to receive an upgrade from uh, Moody's. Um, that also includes responding to any credit ratings, questions or information requests on the overall debt. As Kathleen went over, um, the research department is handled by, research information is handled by Mike Grimm. Um, he's constantly tracking all of our demographic and economic data. Um, he collaborates with local and regional entities to provide a lot of the information. 
He also does research reports and maps. Um, he updates reports that are utilized by these outside agencies. Um, he also does a lot of information requests as well as works on the community survey. And we have provided links on um, at the bottom for some of the reports and maps that he does update. Yeah, a lot, a lot of his reports are also um, posted on his website. So um, just a little plug in for that. The budget office headed by Reginald Lindsay um, handles the operating and capital budgeting. They have a lot of oversight and financial evaluation. Um, they do budget monitoring periodically throughout the year, um, as well as performance measures and special projects. There are several tools that they're, they utilize. Uh, they're responsible for updating the open, uh, updating the open data financial portal. We're working with uh, priority-based budgeting as a tool for um, uh, looking at priority of our program, our UG programs and reallocation of resources to those programs. Kathleen mentioned the GFOA award for the CAFR. Um, we also submit uh, to the GFOA for the budget document and we've been awarded um, the past, we've been, a, we've been a winner in the past four years. We've also, over the past year, implemented a new budget software, Questica, um, that was used in the budget for 2018. This year, we're working on a new capital module that we'll be implementing for the 2019 budget. This graph just shows the um, process throughout the year for the budget department. November and December, we're working on year end. We're studying you know, where we are on expenditures for, for the end of the year. Um, then we move into preparing for the upcoming budget process from December through February, um, probably January through April. We're working with departments on both the operating and capital budget, also working with the administrator's office. Um, we're finalizing and preparing probably from April to June. We hold public hearings as well as budget workshops throughout the month of July. Um, and then once the budget document is award, um, approved, then we're working on the submission of the GFOA award um, in the fall. And then we start, as we get into November, we start with the year-end process. So um, the the Economic Development uh, Finance Administration is, it's not really a division per se, you know, you, you won't see it in the budget book, but it, it's a, a very, uh, a, it takes up a lot of um, our time, Debbie and I, um, as well as uh, Elise Villarreal, Real, and she, so the three of us are constantly working with the Economic Development Department and the County Administrator's Office on a whole slew of projects. Uh, I gotta tell you, I probably have 20 outstanding right now. So, um, and what ha so what happens is um, as projects are worked through the system, you know, and, and there's an actual proposal or pro forma that's been um, proposed or submitted by a developer to the Economic Development Department then that's when we come in. So we, we do a lot of analysis of the proposals. Uh, we develop our own pro formas to match up to see whether um, the developer's uh, request is really you know um, warranted, whether the project can be done without public assistance, for example, or at what level the public assistance should be. You know, we, we kind of look, review all of the assumptions to make sure that they make sense and are accurate and you know review the calculations so w there's a lot of work that goes into that area and I just thought maybe you should I should highlight that for you that you know we, we always try to keep the, cons the, the mm -hmm. estimates conservative so so um, so it's a coordinated economic development um, initiative and we we work very closely with with bond council with our municipal advisor with um, the Economic Development Department, and we actually issue the bonds um, on behalf of the UG out of, out of our office. Um, any kind of special obligation or TIF or CID, this TDD, you know, the whole alphabet soup of various economic development tools. 
um, are administered through our office. And then, um, and then there is a great deal of work that's involved with the administration of these various districts. Um, so we create the districts. Uh, we work with the state to ensure that they've got the right addresses. Um, I did want to mention that Mike Grimm, our research manager, is heavily involved in all of these efforts. Um, but then we also, uh, let's see, we, of course, we have to do all the bond compliance, you know, the arbitrage rebate calculations. We have to ensure that the development agreements are being complied with. Um, we, we calculate all the development um, distribution of revenues um, according to the development agreement. So, you know, a lot of work going on in this area. So, um, I, I, oh, no, there's one more here. So um, now this is the other half of the Treasury Division across the street. That's the Motor Vehicle Registration Division or, or Services. And of course, this is a, a, mandated, a, a mandated program by the state of Kansas. Of course, all, the, all our motor vehicles need to be registered. And, and uh, we have, we've dedicated 27, uh, roughly 27 FTE to do that. And, and here is a, a whole bunch of them <laughs> here at one of our holiday parties. So the uh, uh, so the we have two locations as I mentioned yeah one's at 82nd and State and uh, the other is right across the street at our downtown office and we process the the staff there process uh, 148,000 uh, motor vehicle registrations renewals and new and new titles so there's the vehicle titling and registration there's also the commercial vehicles they handle. And then um, one thing that we will mention later on is that we, have, over the past few years, we, we've been implementing a customer service queuing system that has greatly improved um, um, the level of customer service. So. And then um, the last division we wanted to highlight is our payroll and pension and insurance administration services. <coughs> this, um, this program is overseen by Ron Green, um, who is a, um, um, has a lot of experience in payroll administration. So um, roughly, he, he oversees, he's got a staff, the, the picture there is our, the payroll staff. We, uh, th these gals process 56,000 payroll or paychecks every year. Um, not only that, but they also you know, ensure that all the deductions, donations, and garnishments, and tax withholdings are handled accurately. Um, and we pay all our third-party benefit administration. One thing that we also do is we, we administer the pension um, program where we work with the CAPERS and KPNF to ensure that the, that the pension administration is handled. There's a real customer service element to that, so employees come to the payroll division to seek advice on, on um, you know, actions related to their pensions. And then um, also um, it, within this division is uh, we administer the, oversee the policies that the UG enters into for, for, um, for, for buildings and facilities and for our vehicles and other insurance policies in order to, um, Oh, yeah, and, and general liability as well. So, so all of that is also managed out of the, out of the um, payroll division. So it's payroll insurance division. So Debbie's going to talk about the work plan. So this is just our, um, as we've said, you know, the finance staff is dedicated um, on various aspects of financial management, and we're constantly looking for innovations and efficiencies uh, to lower costs uh, to our residents. So this work plan just shows, you know, what we're doing throughout the year. Um, you know, we have the annual audit process and the budget process and uh, the geo bond issuance all going on in the first uh, half of the year, um, as well as we have economic development um, and TIF projects uh, going out throughout the rest of the year. Any special projects that we might have that come about through the budget approval, um, as well as all of our year end processes, um, any additional work would be in it um, in addition to any of the work that we've already discussed with each of the uh, finance divisions and 
And then we just want to talk about a couple of our reports that we provide, um, uh, just showing our different projects. This past August, we did um, an, a TIP update uh, for a comprehensive report on all of our tax increment financing districts. Um, this is a report that we had revised. We had done a report several years ago, um, but in this one, we went through each project and detailed out um, how much, if there were bonds issued on the project, gave a lot of detail regarding those projects. Um, we've also revised our quarterly financial report. We bring this to the EDF committee um, quarterly, and it just shows um, the budget performance compared to expenditures throughout the year we've also uh, got the investment report that is also provided quarterly um, provides additional analysis and explanations on the UG's investment portfolio um, and we've provided links uh, to each one of these reports if you'd like to look at them in detail so um, thanks the uh so one, one function that we take very seriously is the long-term financial planning project. And um, currently what we're doing uh, is, is providing a long-term financial forecast. And that helps us to determine what, how much revenue we expect to receive um, over, the, over the long term or over maybe the five to 10 year period, um, depending on the forecast period. <laughs> and then also a baseline of how much our expenditures are expected to increase, um, assuming normal growth, right? Or depending on what the, the, the cost area is, you know, um, for example, salaries and benefits, we, we, we basically enter in certain assumptions based on um, the labor contracts and, and such. Now, so this is a forecast and it's not necessarily a plan. So um, in the coming year, we plan to actually come forward with a plan, um, but um, probably later in the year. And so to develop a plan, we need lots of input from our departments, but we also need lots of input from the commission. So um, a formal plan is something that we, we hope, seek to achieve over the next year or two. But uh, um, we just, I just talked with, um, um, Doug over the um, this afternoon about um, our plan for um, for the upcoming budget retreat and uh, we do plan to provide you with some forecasts of how we look at that time um, in order for you to have that information as we enter into the, the 2019 budget process so uh, so we're going to be presenting another forecast at that point so um, but uh, now another project that we're working on is priority-based budgeting. And um, we're, we're through several of the steps. Uh, priority-based budgeting basically um, allows us, uh, it gives us a process or a, a tool to evaluate all of our expenditures and determine um, where, where they rank in terms of priority. And so, um, that's the the short the short explanation. So we 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 have um, consulted or contracted with an outside firm um, that specializes in priority based budgeting, and uh, we're using you know utilizing their services to help us um, work through the process. But we're taking a slow approach. Um, so far, we all the departments have submitted their programs. Um, or an inventory of their programs to us, and we have now figured out how much each of those programs cost. The next step is to um, come up with uh, all of our the goals for the UG, and, and, and we need to clearly define what each of those goals are. And based on that goals and those goals and definitions, um, which will be tied very much to the, the commission's strategic um, goals, right? I mean, that's the baseline, that, that, that's the starting point. Um, but based on the goals and definitions, we'll go back to the departments, and starting with the department heads, and the department heads will be reviewing and looking through each of their programs that are in their inventory, 
and doing and based on the goals we'll be doing a, an assessment of how they feel that program meets that goal um, so it's not a ranking of all the programs it's more how closely um, does that program align with each of these goals so um, that that's a process that's going to take a while um, so and we want to we want to make sure we get it right so you know we're going to be working very closely with the departments over the next six months or so department heads the, then the next step is actually a, there's a kind of a peer review process where um, uh, uh, and we, we still have to work this out but there would be an internal interdepartmental committee uh, or maybe several committees that will review all of the um, the rankings that the departments department heads provided us to determine whether that what they provided us made sense or not so the ultimately the end goal is to determine from a grand scale um, all, all of um, you know of all of our pro programs um, how much how much or the dollar amount are in the like the the top priority level how much are in say the second priority level the third and then the, the last or the fourth and that that tells us how much money um, for example in the fourth um, is um, dedicated to services that uh, maybe are low priority or are not or not performing well or not achieving the objectives of the UG um, and then we can examine possible recommendations for reallocation of those resources to higher priority programs so that's ultimately where we want to end up we don't expect any of that that process to happen um, as part of the 2019 budget process that will all that information we hope to uh, accumulate and complete by the end of 2000 18 and it will be part of the 2020 process so that's that's the plan so oh and so um so there's the gantt chart so yeah go ahead um yeah and then real quickly we have a couple of uh, projects technology projects that we're very excited about now a couple of years ago the the treasury division started um, uh, implemented a queuing system it's a software package or kind of something that uh, another a agency I think it's Shawnee County uh, worked up and and started using and they shared it with us and we've made some improvements to it since but it's really impressive how much how much the, the customer service uh, this customer service queuing system has improved our, our the service we provide to our customers for example, the amount of wait time has dropped since 2014 from 144 minutes to 58 minutes. Um, and we, we, we noted that uh, the, now we're actually surveying our customers and um, those, those um, surveys are coming out, you know, very positive. So we're doing a lot of other things too, you know, there, they're they, they're shifting staffing around and so that there's more staffing available during the end of the month when there are these red days and so so generally speaking the customer service level has really improved in the Treasury Division and then um, Debbie mentioned that we just implemented a new budget software. It's called Questica. It really has a lot of potential. And we're really looking forward to using it. Um, you know, it has a lot of functionality, very robust system. And you know, we we just barely implemented it um, during in order to start the 2000 the, this last uh, 2018 budget. But we, it's got a lot of uh, functionality that we're still exploring. And then um, um, one other, or, well, we've got a couple of, uh, two more projects here. The first one is we also implemented a software system that helped us um, do our financial audit, or actually to prepare our financial statements. Um, this was a very helpful um, software uh, system, and it actually gave us the capability to t tick off or to basically accomplish one of the last findings that 
uh, were, were that was remaining um, from our auditors. That basically, previously the auditors um, were overly involved in the preparation of the financial statements because of our software limitations. So now we're able to do them on our own. And then the last thing is uh, this past the past few months, we actually implemented um, through the Department of Knowledge. Um, they were they did a great job in implementing this new mobile payment system. Um, it's called through MyWico, and it's now um, it's now so now we're actually taking web payments for property tax administration. So web payments and mobile payments for property tax. So. Um, you can always contact me or Debbie if you have any questions on, some, on anything related to finance, and we'll be happy to answer any of those questions. And uh, that's if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. That was quite a presentation. Uh, committee, any questions of staff? <coughs> Anyone from the public care to? ask questions for information only. Let it be seen there was no one stepping forward. Uh, no, no, no action needs to be taken. This was uh, an opportunity for uh, information sharing only. So, <coughs> Kathleen, thank you. I would encourage any member of the committee that uh, performance-based budgeting as well as my WICO, if there's any interest in those, please by all means talk to staff. I think those are two very important parts of this. I love performance-based budgeting. It gives us a, a, a data from, from which to build on our uh, budget and our needs in a, an effective and uh, manner that is accountable. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to work with you on that. Next up, item two is a review of the UG financial policies. And um, cool. so yeah. thank you very much. Now, so um, I have had an opportunity to review uh, we have about roughly 13 financial policies. They're all um, published annually in the annual budget document. And I took a look at them, and um, many of them have not been updated for four or five years. So um, I decided that over the next four or five months, that's what we get to do as a committee. And um, I hope you'll, um, I, I, I look forward to your input because the policies are only as good as the uh, feedback we get from you. So these are your policies. They have to be approved by the commission. Um, you know, th these are not administrative policies. These are commission policies. So um, I'm providing this uh, opportunity for us to take a look at these policies and see what kind of areas or what kind of improvements we can make. Um, so just real briefly, I wanted to to. Just uh, now, by the way, this uh, this um, presentation it has a lot of wording and, and a lot of just narrative sections. I'm providing this really just for you to review and to refer to in the future. Um, it's kind of broken up in different sections. The front part talks about the UG policies and our plan for um, making improvements to those, but then there's also various sections where, as government um, as governing body members. There are a lot of questions that we suggest you um, consider or ask of staff um, in the various different um, um, finance function areas. And then we've also provided some answers to some of those questions. So it's sort of like a guide to, um, to government um, or governing body members um, related to financial management of local governments, all right? So, um, so the first uh, the first question here that many of us ask is, you know, why 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 have policies and procedures? And um, so, as you can see, I mean, it is important for us to 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 focus on policies and procedures, you know. And we're not going to do this every year. We're probably just going to do this every maybe three or four years. But for the next few months, let's take a look at these policies and procedures and make sure that they reflect exactly what. Of the direction you want to take, so that's what that's why it sets the directional tone for the organization, and it also informs all of you as to what the current processes are, and and so by doing so, then we can um, discuss maybe possible improvements to those processes. Um, once we get to 
um, an organization that has good fiscal policies, um, it demonstrates that the organization has a certain level of maturity. And, um, and that helps us with our credit rating presentation. So in our credit rating, uh, well, not the presentations, but the, the actual credit ratings from our agents, the credit rating agencies. And lastly, then, we, it, it helps us to document our processes and, and provides opportunities for improvement so, so that we can um, avoid costs or provide some more savings. So the next few, right. So the, the fiscal, so there's kind of some categories for fiscal policy. And it, let me see if I can start over here. Ah, yes. Oh no, it's going too fast. All right, so so um, so we're going to look at some fiscal financial policies, and they all are broken up into various um, categories. Um, there's the financial planning policies, which have a lot to do with the budget. Um, then there are the um, revenue policies, policies related to collecting revenue and collecting monies. Then there's the expense policies, where we're monitoring expenses, and and then lastly, then there's some other policies that we'll we'll go through as well. So those deal with cash investment and procurement, and some you know dealing with risk management and other areas. All right. So um, as I mentioned, you know we're going to kind of provide you with some questions that you might want to ask as a as a governing body member, and then here are some of the answers to some of these questions. You know why have a written policy, how frequently are these policies reviewed, who's responsible, you know, and then who monitors all these policies. So, and I, I don't want to go through and talk about each one of these because, you know, I've provided this and I, hopefully you've read if you already. If you have any questions, let me know, all right? So other, so now fiscal practices as opposed to policies. Um, here's some questions related to how they're documented, how, how certain practices are, you know, if there's some cross-checking between agent entities so that um, um, to avoid fraud. Uh, training and code of ethics, those are all key components of fiscal practices. And so here's um, some answers to, you know, what, uh, to those questions with respect to the UG. Now, um, so we have, as I mentioned, we have accounting policies and procedures. Those are administrative policies and procedures that are developed um, by the accounting manager and myself and then approved by the county administrator. And we have um, a whole slew of them. We're about to actually upload all of these policies onto our intranet, the city's intranet. I think we're also, we might also be including them on the ESS um, program. So, so that um, administratively, you can well. So, if you need to refer to them, you can find them here. Right now, um, right now, they're not anywhere for people to access. So we we want to you know make them more available. So. So um, so the government, as I mentioned, GFOA and um, a number of local government think tanks. They have certain policies that they recommend, and, and certainly the credit rating agencies expect us to to uh, um, to have these sorts of policies. So, in terms of financial planning, um, what they recommend is that we have a budget policy, um, a long-term financial planning policy, capital asset inventory policy, long-term financial policy for the administration or the how we're going to fund our pension and other post-employment um, costs, and then um, a reserve or, or fund balance policy. So those are basically the policies they expect our, our, us as local government to have. And um, so I took a look at our policies, and, um, and I have a, a summary here of what I've concluded. And basically, our, our um, as I mentioned, all our po policies are are published in the budget book, right? Um, but uh, some of these are due for review, mainly due to their age. Now, the, the, by the way, these page numbers reflect are reflective of the adopted budget because uh, Reggie just um, just uploaded onto the website 
the adopted budget. So the hard copy budgets that some of you have at home, that's the proposed budget. So the page numbers may not be exactly the same in case you um, want to go back and look. But um, so some of these policies are, you know, for example, the budget policy was done in 2013, and you know that's four or five years from now. So it's time for a refresh. Um, some of them we really do need to take a look at. You know, the capital asset inventory, it doesn't really discuss um, an assessment of the condition of our assets and um, or a funding plan for that. So um, our, our capital policy kind of needs some reworking um, to incorporate how we're going to handle deferred maintenance. And so I, I, I'm working with the Public Works Department, um, the Public Works Director. I, he and I have talked, had many conversations about this. And, you know, we're working together on that. So we hope to bring forward a, a capital um, asset policy, a policy that's, that um, achieves those, those objectives. Um, also, they recommend that we have a pension and OPEB um, policy, so we're working on that, and then the, the fund balance. These policies are the ones which I'll be, we will be presenting, uh, actually not just myself, but a lot of my staff members and others will be presenting at the February meeting. So what we, what we plan to do is present to you, because um, we want to kind of update all of the, the policies at once. So I don't know if this is going to be, if we're really going to be able to achieve this, you know, kind of depends on all of you. But my thought was that we would present, um, you know, four or five policies um, in one meeting, uh, present the staff recommendations, then you go back and review and take a look at them, and then at the subsequent month's meeting, then you can tell us any kind of edits you want to make and then approve, and then make a motion to approve those at, at the, the subsequent meeting. And we're going to, and so we're going to do that for the next three or four months, you know, so we'll have all the fiscal planning, uh, the financial planning policy, financial planning policies um, at the February meeting. Then we're going to handle some other, the other areas at the March meeting and then an, another section in the April meeting. I, I provided a schedule there, so we'll talk. Just, just for my clarification. There, there's been no capital asset inventory conducted on in the UG. Well, um, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that that's an accurate statement. Uh, I'm, I don't know. No seems. Okay. I, 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 you'd have to refer to the public works to, um, director, but yeah, go ahead. Just um, there has been um, different um, functions within the public works studied. Um, such as facilities over the years, um, but we are really going back through a comprehensive update of all of our assets um, due to expansion of the use of a software called Lucidy. Um, our new public works director, Jeff Fisher, who's been on board about a year and a half now, um, is um, working with his team with a new asset position that's been created within the engineering division to really deliberately catalog our assets we just drove every street in the unified government and are capturing tons of data that's being then imported and overlaid onto our GIS system. So you're going to start to see major transformations in how we um, are able to share information about our assets as well as how many of those types of things we have. We'd already been doing that very heavily in our wastewater area where we've um, been working with the federal government on compliance with our combined sewers. So kind of moving that protocol over to the rest of the area. And of course, facilities is one that needs a lot of work as well. Well, we really don't know the true value of our assets until we take a, uh, an accurate inventory, and then we'll know how to leverage those assets once we have them, or to dispose of them, what the long-term maintenance needs of them. And we do have some accounting, because we have to book certain assets over a certain value, and I'm going to turn that back over to the accounting folks. <laughs> yeah, so we actually, of course, we do know the value of all our assets, and those are reflected in the financial statements. But those are based on the, the amount um, that we initially the original book you know price and less any kind of depreciation so but what we what we're not a hundred percent clear on or what we're, we're public works is working on is um, 
what is the value of the replacement value or what kind of improvement value needs to be, uh, um, what is that value on our existing assets going forward in the future? So, and, and it, it, there are a lot of assumptions that need to be made and decided upon before we get to that value, so. Well, we should know the true value of our assets owned by the unified government. Uh, any, any good uh, accounting practices include the true value of our assets. Yeah, no, we, we have the true value of our assets. It's um, how, much, how much do we need to spend to bring them all up to, say, 100% functionality, and, and what kind of functionality is appropriate, you know, for example, you know, all, our, all of our streets, for example, um, some of them are in, are in various levels of conditions, right? Um, do, if we were to bring them all to 100%, then how much would that be? Is 100% really what we need to, to be, you know, aiming for? I mean, there's just a lot of questions involved in that, so for example. Um, I mean, is there any of this that we can't read and ask questions about? This is a fairly extensive no. review of your agency and your department. And I really appreciate and respect the work that's been put into this. But I know that many of us are reading through it as we go along or have already read it. Right. Uh, are there, may, is there a few highlights you would like to hit? And then what I would do is ask committee and the public if there's an opportunity for questions of you. And then I would also state that if there's any questions that uh, the public may have, we can write those down and get them to you and review them in next meeting. Sure. So, so I was just going to, so real quickly, you know, this is, these are the revenue policies that will be, we're going to, staff is going to be presenting at the March meeting, right? And because some of these policies are, you know, a bit dated, right? And then here are the expense policies that we also hope to be presenting sometime in the March meeting. And then, and then here are the other kind of policies that, that are not really within the revenue expense or fiscal um, that we also We'll hope we, we might be presenting those at a later date, maybe in April or May. It kind of depends because some of these aren't necessarily um, part of the finance department, so I have to work with the other departments on that. But for example, purchasing it's, uh, was last updated um, in 2007, and I know purchasing has been working on update. So. Um, but I'm not sure she's ready to do that in April, you know, but just to give you an idea, so. So, um, so um, the rest of the presentation is actually um, a review of all those questions and, and, and that you might want to ask as governing body members related to financial management. So you're happy, to, I suggest you read through those. The last, so here, so I'm going through all of Debbie's section here. <laughs> and the very last, uh, actually, this is a good one here. So, <laughs> um, the very, I don't know if I can. Well, we'll just get through this. The very last slide is the schedule. So, as I was mentioning before, on these policies. So what we plan to do is bring forward those first five for the February meeting, right? And then the subsequent meeting, you, you can take a look at them, and then it's a subsequent meeting you would approve them or, or make revisions, right? Um, so March, we plan to bring forward the revenue policies, and then uh, April, we bring forward the expense policies, and then these other policies, we're not real sure when we're going to bring those forward. That's the plan. What do you think? Well, first and foremost, I sincerely appreciate the work and the effort that went into this. And it was not my intent whatsoever to uh, take away the opportunity for you to share with us. We we're, we're all have responsibilities here and to, to read through these financials. And I'm sure there's a plethora of questions that could come from each one of us as individuals. And what I would like to do is if any member of the committee or a member of the public have questions to please put those in written form, submit them to the committee, and we'll make sure that they come to you, and we'll get the answers necessary. Uh, one, I commend, I commend uh, the work that, and the preparation that went into this. Thank you so very much. 
You're welcome. Good job. My pleasure. Is there any questions, comments from the committee? Public? Seeing none, that was for information purposes only. Uh, I would entertain a motion for adjournment, seeing no further business. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Adjournment is in order. Thank you. Thank you.